You've written about the Green Revolution a bit and lectured about it. Um, it turns out that there are now two Green Revolutions. There's the first one, which is Norman Borlaug and NPK and the things that we hear about in the documentaries, and in a way, incredibly successful, right? At least on some terms, producing all of this food from soil that hadn't been able to produce as much before. Um, you've mentioned that, of course, it also relies on fossil fuels in a way that isn't often acknowledged and results in pollutions and algae blooms and dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico in ways that often isn't acknowledged. Um, still, there have been a lot of people who have not starved, right, as a result of the Green Revolution. And so there's got to be some acknowledgement that it was a success on those terms. What's the second Green Revolution and how do you think about the pluses and minuses? So uh, just on that last point, there's still contention over, yes, more food was produced yeah. and food prices went down. And so there was a reduction in the number of people going hungry. But coming back to sort of the shadow of colonialism and imperialism, and if you look at a, a country like India, uh, a re one of the reasons why there were hungry people in the first place had to do with the col uh, colonial post-colonial policies put into place that led to a, a, a reduction in their producing their own food and instead producing food for export to, oh, to Britain. And so the first Green Revolution took place just after World War II at a time when there was a lot of uh, a mobilizing to change things like uh, the division of land and to try to make it more equitable in places like India and places like um, Mexico. And, and so the first Green Revolution, in a way, was a technological solution to reduce kind of those social uh, movements and to provide uh, an alternative. And so, so Green Revolution to prevent a red revolution? It, it was very much framed in that way. Yeah. It, it, was, it was very explicitly framed okay. in that way, and it was really a sort of cold war policy. Um, and so thinking about the current rev uh, Green Revolution, it is uh, different. It, so it is really being directed at Africa, you know, who is uh, the, a continent that is largely seen as being left out of the, the earlier uh, Green Revolution. Um, and uh, it is the same in that it's the same set of technologies. So hybrid oh, okay. seed, uh, fertilizer, pesticides, um, irrigation to a lesser extent, uh, and now uh, genetically modified seeds as a sort of added bonus. Um, so, but it's the same approach in, in a way. What's different is the first Green Revolution was really uh, the state implementing that, so distributing it, uh, providing extension to farmers, whereas now it's the, the role of corporations who also played an important role in the first Green Revolution. So you had uh, DuPont and other large uh, companies that sold these products being very actively involved in um, shaping that first uh, Green Revolution. Um, but in, in this one, it's it, the large uh, agricultural corporations are playing a much more prominent role. Um, and that's a, a sort of a different uh, way that is playing out. Um, so it's the same technologies for the most part, but just in a different place and with different uh, people behind it, different entities. Yes, yeah. yes. Are there different dangers or different benefits that might result from this wave? Uh, well, I think it still all remains to be seen. I, I think uh, one of the dangers is uh, deepening inequalities, which was true for the first Green Revolution. So although there were successes, there were also concerns that it in some places led to greater inequality and some people not able to produce food using those technologies. They couldn't afford the, the um, different uh, technologies. They couldn't get access to capital and so they ended up being landless and, and going and working in the city or going and working on uh, the better off farmers' farms. Um, the same could be true of this uh, uh, revolution and some people see it as one long green revolution but this is sort of a different phase. Um, and uh, 
Another dimension is uh, the role of uh, corporations and foreign investors in gaining access to land in Africa. And uh, so there's this new alliance for food security and nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, which is considered sort of part of this effort. And uh, a number of countries have signed on to that. And it's being promoted by the United States and uh, Canada, among, among others, the G8 nations. And that uh, will... Uh, the countries who sign on in Africa have to allow for more foreign investment in land. And uh, so in some ways it's, it's more neo-colonial in, its, in its, um, uh, the way it's happening in, in Africa because you're seeing investments and, and what are being called land, land grabs where you have kind of shady deals being made between foreign investors and African countries gaining and giving them access uh, to land that's being taken from small scale producers and they're using it to grow biofuels, they're using it for food for export, so it's not really benefiting local local people. And this time it's the Chinese too, right, as much as the, the West? Sure, the Chinese are involved, uh, United States is small, Canada, uh, Europe, and uh, the Middle East. I mean, um, lots of different countries are involved in this land grab, and it's, it's, a, it's a very large amount of land that's been um, acquired for, I mean, a, a more, uh, a less loaded term is uh, foreign land acquisition. Land grab, yeah, okay, foreign land acquisition. But there's been a lot of scholarship around land grabs. Mm -hmm. Um, including uh, within my department, Wendy Wolford has done a lot of work around how, what that looks like on the ground and what that means, uh, a lot of work in Mozambique.